Which fuel do we use? I'm Jeff Brito. I'm Mike Brecken. And today we're going to talk about fuels. Because uh, when we're heating and cooling, uh, everything we do has to have some sort of fuel source or energy source is probably more accurate. Uh, but most of what we deal with is going to be some sort of fuel. The electricity that we use is really an energy uh, in that state, but we're going we're to consider it a fuel for the purposes of this discussion. So the big ones that we see in the area, uh, oil, propane, natural gas, and electricity. Uh, and then we have a few others that are less popular but still around. Uh, we have kerosene, uh, we have you know, firewood, and wood pellets. I think those are the, the Well, you ones. see kerosene a lot when you have an outdoor storage tank. That's right. You either have to use kerosene or you have to use additives, which uh, reduce your BTU value of your number two fuel oil. Right. They call it a, a winter mix for outdoor tanks. Right. So they don't get too viscous and mm -hmm. uh, they won't flow through the little pipe that comes into your uh, combustion device. Right. So which one's best? <laughs> Loaded question, right? The, the one that is best is natural gas, if you happen to be on a line. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do you say that? Because for the cost to make the, the same amount of heat, Right now, no one can compete with natural gas. And how do you feel about the environmental impacts of natural gas? Well, that's not putting those into the equation. Right. And this is what we mentioned in the last episode a little bit about maybe carbon Which is flipping. very, you know, diff that's a, somebody has to decide if, if you are um, trying to reduce your carbon footprint and have a net zero uh, dwelling, natural gas, oil, propane, those are, are you need to be using electricity. Well, because those we are be where renewables come Where from. we get our net electricity yes. as well, because most of our electricity in this area uh, comes from... I right now, Shilla Station's burning coal, yeah. I, I saw that. A lot of it's coming from coal still. Um, we do have natural gas plants in the area. There's a pretty nice one over in, in Manchester that it's idle a lot from what I hear. So is the one here in <laughs> Portsmouth that's mothballed yeah. right at the moment. Which is surprising. Uh, and we have a little bit of biomass going. I think Bo is a biomass. Um, Shilla can be a biomass. Those were converted to burn uh, wood chips, but apparently coal is more cost effective at the moment than wood chips. Right. That's a great advantage of that type of power plant is that it can switch back and forth. Yes. But this, this illustrates the point about when we, when we say, okay, well, electricity's clean. Well, that all depends on where we get it, right? And when we plug into the wall, it's a, it's a crapshoot. You, you can't control in our grid where your electricity comes from. You can buy green power. Uh, you can set up. But that doesn't mean you're green getting power, green power came to your house. That's right. Your house, your house your, got power out of the grid. Yeah. So what you're doing is funding more green adventures uh, for the energy producers. Yes. But what you're getting is still the same old grid power. So when we talk Unless about... Unless you make your own. Well, that, I was going to say, that's when we talk about Mike's got a great solar system set up on his home. Uh, he's generating his own electricity. Except I don't get to use mine. <laughs> uh, you're not home most of the day and it no, goes no. to the electric company. <laughs> Normally people end up with two meters. They mm -hmm. call it net metering. Right. You feed the grid, and the, the electric company reads that. That's plus. And then you take from the grid. That's right. But you, your solar is not connected to your home unless you're going to buy batteries and, a, and another fancy, well, it's, more it's connected, fancy system. But the, the problem is that you rarely use... Uh, all of the solar when it's being produced. So yes. the peak of the, of the day, most of us working people are out at work and everything's shut off at the house. Uh, so unless you've got something there that's consuming it or storing it like a battery bank, like Mike said, it goes out to the grid and you don't see your solar, you know, carbon-free-ish <laughs> uh, kilowatts. Uh, they come back from the grid, which again is whatever came out of the power plants. Right. And I'm not sure that... You, you, Let's say your 
in Portsmouth, which mm -hmm. I believe is public service in New Hampshire. Uh, it used to be. It's, it's now Eversource. Ever, right? Eversource. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that you can buy power from other uh, Constellation or somebody like sure. that. You can, now, you can do choose they your do delivery net, versus your power. Do but, they do net metering also or yes. not? Yep. Oh, okay. All of, all of New Hampshire does net metering. Uh, I'm not aware of any state, at least in New England, that does not do net metering. Um, they might vary a little bit in how they implement it, but it's in New Hampshire and Maine, Massachusetts definitely have net metering programs that work just like you say. Right. You get credits for what you produce, and they, when they sell it back, sell it back to you, they subtract it from your right. your bank. Yeah, you, you bank, and at least in Maine, after two years mm -hmm. after it's gone in, so you need to keep using down your bank, or then you gave them some That's right. power for nothing. Right. Well, not exactly nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, even... And it's way better to net meter than to sell them power. Oh, definitely as a resident. You've got a super deal Two and a half residents. to four cents a kilowatt hour is all they're paying yeah. for power. And so That's a whole less. sale rate, it's yes. called. So you can set up a big old solar farm in your backyard and sell it, but you're not getting the 18 to 30 cents that people pay in the area for, for that power. You're getting yeah. three Average to five. Average New Hampshire is 17.84 cents yeah. right now. Yeah, you get, you get the wholesale rate, which is three to five cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. So it's, it's a much better deal as a homeowner just to do the net metering, uh, even if you put it in a battery bank, because you can, you can do solar with the batteries or without, either way, net metering. Uh, so that, and you then can use the battery bank when instead the of a generator. Yeah. Yes. A lot of great advantages to that system. We could talk about that in another episode. And one of these days, Elon Musk will make a really good battery. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like lead acid is still the standard for that. But, um, yeah, so even, even electricity, um, it's not necessarily clean. Even solar electricity, I, I, before I did this mechanical thing, I was in the semiconductor industry for about 10 years. Uh, making chips in silicon is not a clean process. No. Um, and it's, it's, it's dirty, and there's a lot of power. And if you look into your, your uh, uh, solar research, you, you can actually look up the numbers of how long a solar panel has to be in production to actually pay for its production. Uh, and they'll, they'll often give you the numbers of what, what all that background is, but they rarely give you the environmental impact of the manufacturer. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of stuff. You know, toxic materials. You know, uh, rare earth metals. That's right. So it's not it's not the end all be all. It's not perfect. Um, we, again, we're moving our pollution somewhere else when we talk about electricity. In most cases, even with solar, when we have the solar on our house, somebody and unfortunately most of the solar production is still overseas. So some poor China, some some, some poor place <laughs> over there is dealing with all the. Phosphorus and various thallium and get uh, doped into the silicon when it's made. Uh, so yeah, um, so we got natural gas. We got electricity. Um, I asked you what your favorite was. That was natural gas. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about propane. Well, I didn't say that was my favorite. I, I asked I you what said, was best. <laughs> well, if you want to know what right. to to make your heating system uh, for the least amount of dollars that you're going to pay annually, it's right. natural gas right now. It doesn't mean in three years it will be. Right. Next one probably be propane. Um, so Well, the next the next one for the least dollars you'll put in yearly will oh. be oil. Yeah, in terms of uh, dollars for BTUs, yes. Yes. Uh, oil, number two oil, like this machine behind us, is, is still relatively cheap for the number of BTUs you get out of it, and we'll get into that in a few and minutes. It's, gone down since yeah. fracking came into being. That's right. Um, so we've got oil. Uh, oil has some drawbacks to it. Uh, my personal take is that it, it's it's a lot dirtier. Uh, people will probably give me a lot of negative feedback on that. Uh, but you, know, you get a lot of soot, you know, particularly you, know, you get open vents here where the draft control dampers are. You know, we work in these things all the time. Uh, there's soot all over the place in the basement when you've got oil equipment. Um, even if it's done by, everybody says, well, if it's done by a professional, it won't be that way. No. <laughs> it's just not the case. Um, tends to need more maintenance. 
Um, yes. you, you have to do an annual maintenance on an oil burner. It's just, as clean as they say the fuel they deliver you to, it's full of gunk. You know, we, we're the ones who see the oil cartridges when we take them apart and drain them out. You know, they're, they're full of slime and gook and, uh, and that plugs up the burner and then it's going to stop running in the middle of winter and you're going to call us in a panic. Cause My gonna... observation is over the last 15 years, it has gotten worse. Uh, number two fuel oil, mm -hmm. they allowed uh, not as high a quality to become number two. Yeah. Now diesel, that's a totally different story. Well, it's the same fuel. Uh, number two heating oil and well, diesel, they've diesel. taken the sulfur out. Well, in most well, states, I, in in general, it's actually the same fuel in most cases. There, I think there may be a legal differentiation. Uh, of what's allowed to happen, but I think for practical purposes, even our heating fuel now is for the most part ultra low sulfur, just so oh. that they only have to do it one way. The biggest difference between the two is there's a pink dye in yes. home heating foil. So it, you pay less taxes on home heating oil than you do on highway diesel. Highway diesel you pay road taxes on. So they put the pink dye in it so that you know when they stop a tractor trailer on the on the highway, they take a peek into the gas tank to see if it's pink or not. And if it's pink, they're going to fine them for tax evasion for not paying the road taxes. Uh, so that's why it's pink. But otherwise, it's the same fuel. They can be used interchangeably. If you run out of heating oil uh, in a in a pinch, you can run down to the gas station and fill up a couple of cans of, of uh, highway diesel and pour it into your pour heating it in, system. Yes. It, it'll work just fine. Um, and so. the other thing with uh, number two heating oil, they have what they call B10 yes. bio. That's right. Now what they're mixing in has nowhere near the BTU value per gallon. And so you're, you're paying more for having a greener fuel, so but you're is, getting a little bit less. Right. This is called biodiesel in general. So what, when people talk about biodiesel, it was big a couple of years ago. I haven't heard a lot about it lately. Um, but biodiesel is B10, I think there's a B15 too, right? Oh, there's a B20. So uh, there's several different grades. The issue when it first came on was the gasketing material, right. the sealing material in the um, burners. Mm -hmm. They weren't rated for vegetable right. oil. Yeah, the, the burners, the gaskets on the filters and things, all those rubbers weren't necessarily compatible with the, uh, the vegetable-based oils that were, were coming out in the biodiesel. Right, so and the nozzles and the spray patterns changed. changed. Yeah, so does the viscosity changes probably when yes. you get the, the B10. So that 10 number is the percentage, right? So 10% bio versus 80 or 90% uh, mineral uh, oil, and a B15 would be 15% biodiesel. Uh, you can buy devices that will burn sure. 100% mm -hmm. uh, biofuel. That's right. And, I, and I've seen, uh, I saw an article years ago about... I don't know around here if anyone no, delivers I've, it, I've but seen you it. can. But you can make it. You, you go on the internet, and there's all sorts of kits for making your own biodiesel, yes. um, washing it, and it's, it's pretty crazy. But there's an article a couple of years ago yeah, about... Because it. you're using caustic. That's right. And if you don't wash that out, your equipment won't last very long well, it's, at all. It's soap. And what you get out, it's just this, it's actually the same process people use for making oh, some like sheep, sheep's yes. milk soap and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're separating out those, those caustics and, and you get a soapy product out and then what's left over is the biodiesel. Uh, but I was going to say, there's a, I've read an article about a guy in, I think it was England, five or six years ago, actually got uh, fined by the government for tax evasion because he was making his own heating oil and not paying <laughs> taxes on it. So there's a whole scuff law about putting it in your car uh, and driving around with your own homemade biodiesel and not paying the road taxes. But, uh, so we talked about uh, heating oil, uh, we talked about electricity to some degree. Um, people used to heat with coal, uh, nobody I don't, that I know of still heats with it. My, my mother's got a pile of it in the basement but the stove's long gone. Um, wood, cordwood. Definitely, we got still a lot of people burning cordwood in our area anyway, in New, New Hampshire and Maine. Right, and it's still, there are a lot of manufacturers that you can buy outdoor boilers right. and indoor boilers and furnaces yep. that will burn cordwood. And if you've got a readily available supply of, of wood and you don't mind cutting it or paying somebody to cut it up for you and don't mind stoking the fire, um, you know, 
out of pocket, it's a cheap way to heat the house, right? You've got a free, if, if, free source of fuel. Yes, if you have a free source of fuel, <laughs> right. if you are buying cordwood, it, probably it, a different, it is, different yes. story. Uh, and you can get different deals. I know yes. some people buy a, what they call the grapple load, where they just get logs and they drop it in your yard. You right. Know? So that's cheaper. You can cut it up yourself. And you have to split it. That's a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> and then the next related is wood, wood pellets. pellets which had a big boom for a while when uh, oil prices shot up in 2008, and it seems to have tapered off quite a bit because there were a lot of uh, market impacts at the time. I remember my brother had a, a pellet stove, and he said it, it, it got to the point where they were rationing pellets because it went from a, a niche industry, I, I believe, from where the sawmills had piles of sawdust, and they figured out, well, if we compress it into pellets, we could sell it as fuel. So as long as it was a, a waste product, it was an easy, you know, cheap supply of fuel. But when the oil uh, price spiked in 2008 and every, everybody wanted, well, you know, it, you couldn't buy pellets anymore. You know, they were rationing my brother's deliveries. He could get, you know, one pallet every two months where he's used to just buy the whole season. Um, so then they started actually grinding up trees to make pellets instead of using a waste product. Now the price went up because it's, it's raw material versus scrap material. Uh, but it is still, uh, you know, for a lot of people, they, they feel it's a green product. It is relatively re re renewable. You know, you can grow a new tree in 30 Correct. years, uh, unlike any of the other sources of fuel that we have. Yeah, and even small stoves uh, over the years have developed little automatic feed systems. You get your pellets in bags and you pour it in the feeder. That's right. And it just keeps going and yep. you fill the feeder every few days. And we even have uh, modern systems. I have a customer that has a, a, we didn't put it in, but we have a customer that has a, a, a wood boiler that has a fully automated um, a storage system. So the truck drives up just like it was an oil delivery and they hook up a, a hose to the side of the house. There's a fitting out there and it blows pellets into a big storage uh, bin in the basement. And that has an automatic blower that blows pellets over to the boiler when it needs them. They say it runs twice a day or something. Fills up the little hopper on the boiler and they never touch it. Um, so wood pellet uh, equipment has come quite a ways. Yes. And uh, we should probably dive into that and take a look and see what, see what that industry looks like because we've got some dealers in the area. So now the question, now that we've talked about what the fuels are, how do we compare them? Uh, because it, it's not easy. <laughs> Correct. They're, they're all different and they all have their nuances, unfortunately. Um, so one of the big things, one of the big key metrics that we have to look at with any energy source or fuel source is the BTU content. So BTU is the American term. Uh, this is a, a measurement of energy. Uh, we say that... It's a, the a, English term. It's well, a British thermal unit. Yes. <laughs> um, it's the heat required to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit at standard temperature and pressure. Correct. So this is a, a unit quantity of energy uh, and every fuel or energy source can sort of be broken down into these terms. Uh, so when we look at oil, uh, that's you know about 139,000 BTUs. 800. 139,800 per... <laughs> and this probably varies depending on what you get for. Yes. They, uh, and different sources. sources say 139.5, other sources say 140, but typically people figure 140,000 yeah, per gallon. Yeah, round number. Uh, so per gallon you get that many BTUs. So that tank in your basement mm -hmm. is about, has about um, the same number, if you have a 250 a standard tank, as about 105 bags of pellets. Right. So we look at um, different fuels and different energy sources, they'll have different BTU content. Uh, so when we compare a gallon of oil versus a gallon of propane, uh, even though they're similar liquid volumes, even though propane's sort of a gas, uh, we get delivered in, in liquid form. Correct. So a gallon of propane is only 98,000 or so BTUs yes. per gallon. So there's significantly less energy in a gallon of it. So if we're trying to and store natural it. gas is even less. That's right. Fortunately, we don't typically store natural no. gas, so it comes through a pipe through it. But that's uh, it's also sold differently. Yes, so it's we, sold it's by not the, a gallon, uh, <laughs> thousands of cubic feet. It's a which is a therm. Right. Okay. Depends on the, the natural gas company how they that's sell right. it. It's generally thought of as a therm is a hundred thousand BTUs. Correct. So you you 
buy by 100,000 BTUs, but that number is, I, I believe, wishy-washy. Well, mix what happens in stuff. the wintertime in New England, if uh, the pipelines can't supply enough, they mix in um, other combustible gases mm -hmm. um, to make up so they can get the appropriate volume and keep the pressure up. Right. And this changes the BTU content. Yes. And we see some more modern equipment, like uh, you know, Wiesman is famous for their, their they didn't sponsor us, <laughs> they're famous for their uh, uh, Lambda uh, sensor. Lambda Pro. Which is a, much like on a car, it's an oxygen sensor. It measures the combustion that's going on, and they do that because there is variation in the, in the fuel that you get. So their, their boiler and some of the other manufacturers out there as well, uh, I know Baxi makes a, a well, well, you remember when the pipeline came down from the landfill in Rochester to UNH? Right. Uh, they tried the Lambda Pro mm -hmm. with just uh, the gas from the landfill, Which and was it's so low, miserable in, gas. <laughs> yes, in BTU value, it wouldn't burn. So right, right now they, they they mix it, mix quite a bit of natural gas into yeah. that to burn it. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the European market, we see a lot more of, of uh, uh, natural gas, and, and that naturally is where Eastman comes from. Uh, and I, and I, I don't Thanks know. Thanks to Russia. <laughs> yeah. And the, Ukraine. Well, and... Their fuel comes from there, but uh, in my past, I've traveled a bit through there, and I, I've seen a lot of you know, small farms actually producing their own gas. It, they see these um, you know, brickwork. Oh, digesters? Yeah, brickwork rounds, you know, probably 20, 30 feet in diameter with a rubber membrane. Oh, puffed up on top because it's capturing all the composting, uh, animal waste and whatnot. But, so yeah, so we've got a therm of, of uh, natural gas is about 100,000 BTUs, and and these are the, the the units that we get sold the stuff in. By the way, so and right now in New Hampshire, a the average price for therm and natural gas is 96 cents. Right, I, I've seen commercial clients paying 80 cents. You know, well, yes, it, it 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 can be quite cheap. Yeah, a, and that's what they call tier one and tier two, and that's based on the volume you burn. Right. Used to be uh, the tiers were different prices, but right now, for some reason, they're the same. I think, I think it's just because there's so much natural gas. You know, we've, as I say, we've got a glut of natural gas at the moment that it's just, they can't sell enough of it, so they've right. got to they gotta bring the price down to try and move more material. Um, yeah, so you, you buy a gallon of oil, you buy a gallon of propane, you buy a therm of natural gas. Um, you what? buy a ton or a bag of pellets, you buy yep. a cord of wood. A cord, yep. So a, a, a you know, BTU content per ton of, of pellets is a, is a pretty important number to look at. And that changes dramatically uh, depending on what kind of pellets you get. So you don't want to go shopping and say, I just need a ton of pellets. You want to say, no, I want a ton of hardwood pellets because uh, that's significantly more energy than if you got a ton of softwood pellets. You know, pine trees don't have nearly as much BTU content as oak does. Uh, so it's the same with cordwood. Sure. We tend to get uh, hard, well, we have a lot of hardwood forests, so mm -hmm. the cordwood people get tend right. to be seasoned hardwood, well, which you, is higher value. If you're, if you're burning indoor uh, with cordwood, you, you really need to stay away from the softwoods uh, for creosote reasons. Yes. We've got cords of wood, we've got tons of pellets, we've got uh, gallons of oil, gallons of kerosene, we forgot that one, gallons of propane. So when we look at these, they'll all have a BTU content. So when you're comparing two sources, we get... Kerosene is slightly less than uh, number two fuel right. oil. Uh, so we're comparing two fuel sources. So if we're going to say, well, I want to compare doing, do I do propane or do I do oil? Uh, one of the things, and there's many, is that we're going to say, okay, there's 149,000 or 140,000 BTUs in, in oil, but only 98 in propane. Uh, and how many dollars do I pay per BTU for the fuel? And now we've got a level number. We can say, okay, this is, you know, uh, say it's 10 cents per BTU, and this is, you know, 12 cents per BTU. Typically in our area at the moment, it's a little bit higher for propane. Um, so now we got to go to the next step. Okay. Now that we've got a cost for the BTUs, we got to put that BTU through a machine. And we talked in the last episode about efficiency. So what do we get back for heat out of those BTUs? Well, we've got an advantage now in the propane. So even though the fuel was more expensive, 
typically the equipment's a lot more efficient. You know, with oil, for the most part, there are exceptions, we're limited to around 85%. Correct. You, you can get condensing oil equipment. I've never sold one. <laughs> They're really expensive. Uh, you gotta, if you condense the flue flu gases on oil, we talked a little bit about sulfur and ultra-low sulfur. There's still some sulfur and other things in the heating fuel that when it condenses, it's very acidic. Uh, and we see that a lot. Well, I have sold some oil condensing equipment and this is quite a few years ago. Mm -hmm. The boilers weren't terribly successful, but the furnaces were. Uh, so when we, we compare, we need to say, okay, what's our BTU content? And then how much of that BTU do we get back from the, from the appliance? 85% in your most of your oil equipment, not hard to get 95 or more percent in a propane piece of equipment. So even though we might pay a little bit more for the propane, we're getting a lot more of it back from the equipment, we might be in, in level ground on that perspective. Yeah. Plus multiple stage in propane and modulating. Right. And that'll, that'll be in a, in a follow-up uh, uh, episode where we talk about the different types of of heating systems and, and how that can, because uh, we, we do get modulating uh, uh, equipment, but you can't really do that with oil for the most part. <laughs> it's, it's you can have big, multiple stage on big right. gigantic oil equipment. Some, some big, big oil equipment will actually have modulating burners, but now we're, we're talking about things that heat hospitals versus things that heat houses. Correct. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's our next step. And then you might want to add on top of that, the next thing is maintenance. What is the maintenance cost? Um, now most propane equipment manufacturers and, and manuals will tell you you're, you're still supposed to service it annually. Um, in practical terms, when we go to do it, there's nothing to clean. <laughs> there's, there's just nothing in there. Uh, you know, your, your electrodes and your uh, flame sensors, sometimes they've got some growth if we're right on the, on the waterfront. Uh, you might get some oxidation growth on there. Uh, but typically they'll run for two, three years without needing much service. Right. Um, so service costs tend to be a bit less on the propane side. Uh, so again, another, another thing that shifts what we compare. And we compare all of our different appliances these ways. And the upfront cost of the appliance itself tends mm -hmm. to be less for a propane appliance. That's right. And, and it so, doesn't have to be as heavy duty. That's right. It's not a giant cast iron thing. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is on the next next episode when we talk about the appliances. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we can compare now uh, the electric machines, and it's a little bit simpler, even though the math might be a little more complicated, uh, because there's almost no maintenance with electric machines. Uh, we, we're talking about mini split heat pumps or uh, even just geothermal it's filter changes is, is really all the, the predicted maintenance is. Uh, they're all sealed, they don't burn anything, so they don't make soot. Um, it, you, if, as long as you're not throwing grass clippings into the outdoor units and whatnot, you know, assuming we take care of things, uh, there's really very little maintenance involved. Uh, so it's just a matter of looking at, okay, what does my electricity cost and what is the efficiency of the machine to give me that, that BTU output? Because we can convert electricity into BTU content the same way we do with the others. Um, there's 3,412 BTUs in per a kilowatt hour. Right, in a kilowatt. And that's how we buy electricity, by the way, is in a kilowatt hour. Uh, when you look at your electric bill, it'll, it'll have a thing, what your cost is. Well, sometimes that can be hard to read, too. There's usually like 20 different categories. <laughs> but it, in general, it's charged to you in a kilowatt hour. Right, so if you want to... You take your kilowatt hour usage and uh, divide it by the total number at the bottom. Right, and that's Don't how know. much it costs you for a kilowatt hour. Because <laughs> they get you with delivery charges, they get you with taxes, they get you with uh, energy Well, it's like recovery. a cable bill. Basically. Yeah, kind of, yep. Uh, There's a little tax on there now for broadcast TV, yeah. which you may or may not be able to get. <laughs> so uh, so I, I always tell people, just take the number of kilowatt hours from the meter and divide it by the, what, you, what you paid. That's yeah, well, the, that's what you're paying. Right. That, that's the way to do it. Don't, don't get too hung up on what's in the middle. Uh, so, yeah, so we use all these numbers, and now we can make some cost of, of ownership uh, comparisons. Again, we, we touched on a little bit in the last one about uh, uh, the differences in, in comfort as well. So 
And that's not, not something you can put a dollar figure on. So now you're going to have to have a discussion with your comfort technician of, okay, um, yeah, these, these two are maybe similar or this one's better, um, but what are the other impacts that, that, that come involved? And, and we'll wait for another, uh, another episode to discuss that. So I think we covered um, different fuels and what it means. Um, if you were hoping for us to tell you which one's best for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the answer is really personal. It, it comes down to what you have available where you're at um, and what you have for an existing system or what you're planning to buy for a future system and make some choices about uh, what you think the futures are going to be in these different prices as well. Because you know, 10 years ago, the, the, the market was totally different. You know, right, and oil was four dollars a gallon, not two dollars a gallon. Air conditioning? Do you want it? That's right. That would make a, a big, big difference. Sure. In what's proposed for a system? Absolutely. Um, in in the type of system. So, you know, if you if you want cooling, you're either going to have mini split heads or ductwork. That's that's really the only way to do it. So that's it for this one. If you liked what you heard, uh, please hit subscribe. Uh, give us some suggestions in the comments section about what you want to hear. And we'll definitely try and make some episodes about it. And uh, until next time, thanks. Thank you.